Hello, I'm Wei-In Bota, and I'd like to talk to you about ICT in education, specifically the use of information and communication technologies to improve educational systems of the developing world. And while the future, I believe, is so bright that we do have to wear shades, like these two young ladies in northern Australia, to get there is going to have to change the minds that we have around ICT in education. First, let's talk about the teachers. So this is what the normal classroom looks like in the developing world. A teacher, almost always a woman, has very minimal tools, in this case a book, maybe if she's lucky several books, to try to fill the young minds with learning and education. The classroom that she's in is pretty basic like this, where chairs and tables for the students are optional, and where electricity and windows are rarities. In fact, while this is a looks like a basic school, this is actually a wealthy school. This is what a basic classroom looks like. Notice that it's pretty much devoid of everything. I mean, even the chalkboard is merely paint on the wall. And that's the reality that we have to deal with often. Now, at the same token, you might be wondering about the students. Don't. There's definitely plenty of students to go around. In fact, a key challenge has actually been overpopulation of students. We had the push around open education for all and the idea that Every child in every country should have a free access to primary education, and that's a great idea. The one downside is that it's become a very overcrowding situation in these classrooms. As you can see here in rural Tanzania, oftentimes you get over 100 children per classroom. And I'm not sure how much that is teaching versus crowd control. But the same token, when we talk about ICT, people often think of this. They think of a laptop for every child. And while that's the great name, um, and a great cause celebre for an organization, it's not really the, the reality that we can deal with in the developing world. We just do not have the money to put a laptop for every child. And, well, oftentimes we don't have that money for even rich countries. So in poor countries, it's beyond a fantasy. It's something that will never happen except in very few, very elite schools. And that's a reality we have to accept. But at the same token, there are many technologies that are actually going out and about in the developing world that are easy and accessible and we can build on. The most basic is the mobile phone. And the most basic of that is the good old Nokia text phone. But in reality, we have all different types of phones that are now available in the developing world, oftentimes in the hands of students. We're looking at almost 100% mobile phone penetration in the next few years. And mobile phone penetration in the sense of everybody who wants or could have a mobile phone will get one. Granted. The future is not today, and mobile phone technology is not evenly distributed. As you can see here in Tanzania and Zimbabwe, mobile phone coverage oftentimes is limited to the high density areas of major cities and major traffic routes. But in that sense, mobile phone technology is gaining and is growing. We'll just be careful to make sure we realize it's old school feature phones versus modern smartphones. As you can see in the bottom left, the download speeds for a mobile phone oftentimes are lacking, to say the least. What you're seeing there is um, the download speeds in Arusha, sorry, Abuja, the capital of Nigeria. And if you see there, the 288 speed is actually slower um, today than the speeds that I would get in back in 1995 in Washington, D.C. So the technology infrastructure is coming, but it's not always that great. But still, we can get started. We can get started because solar power is now much more prevalent across Sub-Saharan Africa and around the world. And not just solar power, but also the ability to recharge mobile phones. These mobile phones are from rural Mali. And way out in the middle of nowhere in rural Mali, we still have enough infrastructure where you can recharge, what is that, almost 30 mobile phones um, from a standard car battery. So the future is coming, and it's coming quickly. So in that sense, this teacher Let's talk about ways in which we can empower her with technology. And I'm really specific here that we should be empowering the teacher versus the students. In the sense that there are plenty and plenty of students, often of varying capacity, and oh, the numbers are just overwhelming. But teachers now, there are less teachers. The teachers are more capable. We have a better capacity to work with them over the long term. And if you train a teacher, she can then empower students for generations to come. So in that sense, we're really trying to focus on the teacher. And to do that, one of the first things that we have to realize is the teachers are usually overwhelmed. 
these are stacks of papers, and teachers are having to deal with these to try to find out how a student's progressing. We can use technology to help him or her. One way is by using something called Tangerine, which is a program from RTI, where you can use a mobile app to understand the progress of a child in a language. So that way a teacher understands how the child is progressing. She can share that information with parents and with administrators. And take it to the next step, there's something called a TeacherMate. So a TeacherMate is a technology tool that you can use in the classroom to test individual students on their understandings of the classwork. And in this concept, it's a teacher mate because this, the information gleaned from the children working with the technology is presented to the teacher in a way where the teacher can understand where the child is and adjust her teaching with that child as necessary. Now, one thing, the great thing we can do is also provide teachers with open educational resources. That is, educational resources that they are able to edit and distribute themselves. And there are many, many organizations and programs trying to make this happy. One of the more famous ones is the Khan Academy, where a gentleman is actually recording high quality videos to help students learn, and teachers can use this as supplemental material to their learning objectives. At the same token, what I really want to see is more of teacher hotlines, a way for teachers to be supported in the classroom or in their area. And I can see this very simply being done with a mobile phone, where the teacher is texted in the morning or in the evening and given an idea of the curriculum they should be covering the next day in class. If they have questions, if they're concerned, if they need help, they can call a hotline and then talk to another teacher and understand where they should be working in and how they should get through that curriculum that day. And that to me I think is a very powerful concept, teacher support network. We do not focus enough on this in the education space. Next there are several different technologies we can use for students outside the classroom. Because I really believe that technology for students in the classroom is kind of a challenge. But outside the classroom, we have a better capacity of working with students that have the ability to learn and grow in their educational activities. So one interesting program is Janala, which is a BBC activity in Bangladesh where people in Bangladesh can call in and for about the price of a cup of tea, learn English language. And so over time, you're having this great self-funding mechanism for people to learn a language, a very important language apparently for that country, in an affordable way and at their own time and their own pace. Another concept is MPREP, a group in Kenya that is looking at the test-taking capacity of students and helping them work on those tests. So in the sense that there are big tests in Kenya, um, mainly between elementary and secondary school and secondary school and college, and students are preparing for them uh, all year long. And you never really know how well a student is doing unless you give them practice tests. And so the idea of MPREP is to give them practice tests on their mobile phone so they can actually understand how they're doing. And even better, share that knowledge with both their teachers and their parents so all three can work together to make sure the child passes that test. And then in South Africa, the Yauza group realized that, that there would be more mobile phones than books in most homes in South Africa today and always. So rather than trying to add more books, they put the books on mobile phones. And so they made serials of a lot of books. So you would read a chapter, have to take a quiz to make sure you understood the chapter, and then you could go to the next chapter. And if you're ever wondering if that's really good literature, well, Tale of Two Cities and many other Charles Dickens and other great authors were actually done as serial novels in newspapers. And that's how we got some of our classic literature. So doing the serials is actually a great way to get people engaged in understanding in short bite-sized amounts. Then you can also introduce games. And I really love this concept of, do you remember the snake game on a basic mobile phone where you tried to make the snake eat little bits and as you eat little bits, the snake would get longer and longer and you would try to eat more bits before you ran into your tail? Now imagine that using words in the sense that you actually have to eat the letters of a word in order. So let's say the word is weigh in. You would actually have to find W, then A, then Y, then A, then N in that order. So in this way, it's a fun game, but it's also teaching spelling to a child. And then in India, there's an interesting organization that is working with um, actually older students. 
and they're doing quizzes, so they're doing jigsaw puzzles, but they're also doing fun games where you try to decide what symbol goes with the letter. In this case, a drum goes with this letter, and that's how the person remembers what that letter sounds like or what it does in the alphabet. Now, one of the most amazing programs I've seen is World Reader, and that's taking the concept of books, putting them as ebooks, and then putting those ebooks in the hands of students. So thinking about literacy as a foundation for so many different activities. I mean, if you can't read the word problem, how are you going to answer the math quiz? And in this sense, World Reader is pushing a lot of content to a lot of young Gahanians and Kenyans to help them learn how to read and read better. And what I really love, like this photograph illustrates, is the opportunity for transgenerational learning. So where students are actually reading with their parents or sometimes even for their parents, and the two generations are learning literacy together. And if you're really lucky, you can actually have this happening in, on a technology device, in a print material, and also in supplementary activities for the classroom. But the reality is that's relatively rare. The reality is oftentimes we are giving our students empty books. A book like this with no content whatsoever. We give them a piece of technology, we forget the content goes with it. Or we fund the technology and we're so caught up in buying the coolest gadget that we forget that without the, tech, the content to go with it, yeah, the technology is about as useful as an empty book. And you might say, ah, but they'll scribble in it, they'll write in it. And yes, they will, but only the things they like and only a select few. We can see that with the Wikipedia. While you notice here that there are few German and French speakers relative to everybody else, they are much higher up on the scale of Wikipedia articles than you would imagine. And I feel sorry for this for 8 million HOSA speakers, of which there are only 120 Wikipedia articles to choose from. So in that sense, let's focus on the technologies that are most prevalent. I'll give you a pop quiz. Which of these four technologies, radio, mobile phones, laptops, or e-readers, is the most prevalent throughout the developing world? I sure hope you said radio, because that is the answer. And so if we go with radio, if you see along the bottom here, you have an idea of radios that you can have in a classroom. And that radio is beautiful. You could have interactive radio instruction, where a instruction comes in over the radio about a topic. The teacher and the students listen to the radio announcement around that topic. And then at pre-described times, the radio station goes silent, and the teacher picks up in the classroom and works with the students. Also, another way to look at this is that you could have just mere audio files, so not even have to deal with the radio station. And that's the beauty of the talking book, which is the device, the green and blue device at the top, where think of it as an MP3 player on steroids. You can put a lesson on the device, and the students can go forward, backwards, say yes, no, and answer questions through the device. And it's all in the native language of the user, which is great when you're working with literacy or literacy challenge students. At the same token, people often think, oh, these are so hard to do. Well, the beauty is they're actually not that hard. If you notice here, this image was taken in 2006. If you look at that calendar on the upper left, it's actually rural Mali is a, a radio station up beyond Timbuktu. And yet, through them, we were able to get high-quality content out to people. We got it out as through the radio station itself, right? So spoken text. Um, but also, people could bring in their flash drive or people could bring in their mobile phone, and we could add it to either of those devices as well. So you could have video content on the mobile phone being delivered by the radio station. Our print content delivered by the radio station in the form of text messages sent to its listeners. So there are many, many ways to bring in these different technologies to improve education. But let's go back to that teacher for a second. And let's really think of where we want her to be. My beautiful dream, where I want to see going, is something like this. This is one of the highest rated teachers in one of the elite private schools in Jordan, which is in itself a developing country in many aspects. Now, she has access to all the most amazing technologies. But do you know what she feels is the best technology in her classroom? the technology of having students sit at shared desks and work together. So even though that she has the most modern technologies at her fingertip, she's really thinking about pedagogy. She's thinking about curriculum, content, and then finally technology is the last. And that's really how we should approach it too. Teacher first, then pedagogy, content, curriculum, 
and then finally the technology is the underpinning of it all. And so with that concept, we know that this technology is coming. Our students are going to be wired, and they're going to be like these two kids, enjoying their time with the technology. So let's not worry too much about that and worry about the content and learning that should be going on with the children. Because that's the future that we want to have, children that are learned and excited. So with that, I think our future is going to be bright. Bright enough that, yes, we really should be wearing shades. And I hope you enjoyed my talk. And if you have further comments or questions, I actually run something called the Educational Technology Debate with the World Bank and UNESCO. And each month we have a great conversation around what are the technologies, what are the approaches that are really working to empower the educational systems of the developing world. Thank you and have a good day.